All right, now that we've talked about the basics of what this course is all about, let's go ahead and set up our Rust development environment. The first step that we have to take in this uh, chapter is to actually install Rust. So let's go ahead, I've prepared some stuff in here to show you. So let me do some screen reshuffling in here and let's go here and to Safari. So the first link that you want to visit in order to install Rust is the one that I'm showing at the bottom of the screen. At the time of recording this video, this link is valid. However, it may change in the future since I'm, since I'm not the person in charge for actually deciding what this URL uh, is going to end up being. Um, so if you go into this URL and it doesn't exist, it's best that you just Google it and search for install Rust until you end up in the Rust's installation uh, uh, website. So here we have uh, the URL that's shown at the bottom of the screen. And you can see that there is a command that you can paste into a Unix-based operating systems terminal, such as Mac OS or Linux, for instance, if you have Ubuntu. And this is all you really have to copy and paste into your terminal in order to install and compile Rust. Uh, however, if you're on Windows, for instance, there is a link in here, which is called Other Installation Methods at the moment. And if you click there, then there's instructions on how to install Rust on all operating systems, including Windows. So there is an executable file that you can actually download and install for Windows in order to install Rust. So please go ahead and do that before uh, continuing with the rest of this course. The next thing that we need to take care of is um, a text editor. Uh, so. Uh, I, for all my courses, am using Visual Studio Code, which is an open source and free text editor. And it is um, it is not an IDE that is Visual Studio, but Visual Studio Code is a text editor. So it's a much simpler version of Visual Studio, uh, you could say. Um, so I really recommend Visual Studio Code for this course. If you're if you're on Visual Studio Code, you can install it on Windows, Linux, and and all pretty much all distributions on Linux. I even have Visual Studio Code running in Raspberry Pi. So um, and also Mac OS, of course. So uh, let's go ahead and say install. Let me see if I can find that. Install Visual Studio Code. All right, and then you will end up in this URL as you can see in here. Code that Visual Studio Code visualstudio.com slash download. And in here, you can see there's a, a various versions of uh, Visual Studio Code that you can download. So on Mac, for instance, we have for Intel chips and Apple Silicon, or you can download the universal version of it. If you have an Apple Silicon uh, Mac, uh, it's best just to download that version so you don't get a bloated universal version. And if you have an Intel one, just in, download the Intel one. And Debian-based um, Linux distributions such as Ubuntu, you can download this version. But I know on Ubuntu, it's available actually on software download. So if you just go to uh, Ubuntu and then press the uh, window key on your keyboard and then type software, you'll get to software download. And from software download, you can just go and install a, an application called Code, which is Visual Studio Code. So you don't have to download Visual Studio Code from here if you're on Ubuntu. That's what I'm uh, trying to say. And on Windows, you can also download it from um, one of these links, as you can see in here. So 64-bit version is for, as you can see, there are three buttons in here. Um, it is Windows 8, or which one is it? I don't actually understand how these buttons are linked because there's like so many of these buttons and then three versions of Windows that are supported. So, um, but I think if you're if you, you just click on the 64-bit version, the first one perhaps, it or is it that there are three buttons uh, for 64-bit because there are three versions of Windows supported in here? Does this mean that the first 64-bit button is for Windows 8, the next one is for Windows 10, and the next one is for Windows 11? maybe uh perhaps so um so that's really it for uh, downloading a visual studio code and after downloading you just need to follow the steps required in the installation in order to install visual studio code so what we're going to do now is to go ahead and create a folder and an actual github repository for our code now you don't have to create a github repository but what i've seen time and time again is that uh, some people who are following my courses they may have some problem with the code that they're writing so from time to time they ask me for help because there is a discord group available for this course as well um and 
and at that point when they ask for help when their project isn't working as expected then i need to ask them okay where is the github repository for your project so that i can help you and then that is the point that they say oh i don't have a github repository so that they have to go and create one so I think it's best that if you're following along with this course, it's best that we all go ahead and create a GitHub repository for it. And we could just make it public. And if you're not comfortable with that, you can start with private repository and then make it public. So I'm going to close this page, this page, and this page. So we end up in GitHub. Then let's go ahead and say new in here. And I'm just going to say Rust Crash Course in here. All right. So I'm going to say Rust Crash Course. Um, I'm going to make it public. It doesn't, I don't have any reason right now to make this a private repository. So if you're not comfortable with that, go ahead and create a private GitHub repository for yourself. But for me, it's fine that it is public. I'm going to add, an, add a readme file because I always find that easier because it creates the initial commit and uh, basically initializes the repository. If you don't want to add that, it's fine as well, but then you have to manually initialize your GitHub repository. For the git ignore, let's go ahead and say that we are working with Rust, if I can spell it. And then as license, I usually go with MIT license. All right, so we're good to go. And I'm just going to press the Create Repository button in here. Good. Let's copy the link provided in here. And let's then go to Terminal. And I am in a folder called Dev Projects Rust Clones. You don't necessarily have to be in, in such a folder. You can just clone it wherever you see fit on your computer. OK? So um, let's go in there. And I'm just going to say git clone. And then, oops, not that link. I'm going to copy this again. And I'm going to say git clone and then paste that in. So this is going to clone that repository for me. And let's go ahead and say CD Rust Crash Course. So we're here now. OK, that's great stuff. What we're going to do then is to go ahead and create our project. So uh, the creation the creation of a Rust project is usually done with Cargo. And Cargo, the way that I like to explain it is that Rust compiler does the compiling of your Rust source codes and putting everything together. Everything else is done by Cargo almost everything else. So you can say like your dependency management, creation of projects, et cetera, et cetera. So Rust compiler is a separate program. It works on its own. And then you have Cargo, which does everything else. So since the Rust compiler can't create a project for you, Cargo is going to do that for you. So that's like the easiest way of understanding what Cargo actually is in the Rust world. And Cargo is a program that has now been installed on your computer after, after you've installed Rust. So there's no magic in there either. So let's say Cargo new, and then uh, we say Rust crash course. OK, so you can see this, this went really fast. It just has created a binary application. And we'll talk more about these, what this actually means, packages and paths and modules and crates. There's lots to learn about these things. But for now, just know that you've created a, an executable or an application with Rust. OK, so now that we have that in this folder, I'm just going to execute code dots to open up Visual Studio Code. All right, so here we are. We have Visual Studio Code open. And the next thing that we need to do is actually to set up Visual Studio Code. Now, since you may have just installed Visual Studio Code, you also need to set up a few things we can, before you can move on uh, with the course. So let's go in here, and we're going to go into the Extensions tab in here. And then the first thing you need to do is install the Rust Analyzer. So let's go in here, Rust Analyzer. All right. So previously, there was an extension of Visual Studio Code called Rust, and that is deprecated now. And um, it had great functionality, but to be honest with you, it was the functionality was lacking, uh, such as like data type um, hints and inlays. So now there is a new extension called Rust Analyzer. So you need to find this uh, extension in here, Rust-Analyzer. And then for you, the buttons in here will probably be different. Because for me, at the moment, it says disable, uninstall, switch to pre-release. This is because I already have the Rust Analyzer installed as an extension of Visual Studio Code. But for you, it's probably just going to say install. So all you need to uh, do in here is just to press the Install button in order to install the Rust Analyzer. And after pressing Install, you may have to reload your Visual Studio Code. And that will actually indicate for you. This button will turn into Reload Required. All you have to do is just to press that button again 
it will automatically reload Visual Studio Code instance for you, and Rust Analyzer will be ready to help you in your Rust development journey. After doing that, we also need to install a theme. Actually, we don't have to do that, but um, I get this question quite a lot, actually, uh, what theme I'm using in uh, Visual Studio Code. And the theme that I'm using is called Tokyo Night. So Tokyo, if you just type Tokyo, you will get to Tokyo Night, and then you will have a, the ability in here to actually install it. So Tokyo Night has three, I think, versions. So if you say set color theme in here, you can see Tokyo Night, Tokyo Night Storm, and Tokyo Night Light. I use Tokyo Night, the pure Tokyo Night. There is a Tokyo Night Storm, which is a little bit lighter. I don't like the light colors, but it is completely up to you which one of these versions you want, or even if you want Tokyo Night at all. But if you're wondering what theme I'm using in Visual Studio Code, then you at least know. Now it's called Tokyo Night, OK? After doing all of this, let's go ahead and actually get started with the course. The first thing uh, that we're going to do is install a component in Rust called Clippy. Now, as you get more into Rust development, you'll learn about Clippy, and you'll understand what it does. But uh, as a short thing, you can say, if you're, for instance, coming from the Flutter world, you'll know Clippy is going to be kind of like your linter. It is going to be like um, uh, the Flutter linter in that it can give you warnings, and it can give you errors. It can give you hints on how to improve the code that you've just written. It can sometimes complain completely and say, this, is, this just doesn't going to work. And sometimes it can just give you like a hint, say, hmm, that what you've done is kind of gonna is kind of uh, gonna work fine, but it is not the best way of doing it. So, and Clippy is kind of like a community-driven effort in Rust, in that people have gone in and like put a lot of effort into creating Clippy and all the rules. So, if you're gonna work for a company uh, later after taking this course, hopefully, uh, you you won't be surprised when people actually are using Clippy in even large organizations. So. Now that you're getting into Rust development, I actually suggest that you begin in the correct uh, path by learning about Clippy and learning to actually accept the uh, inspirations that Clippy can give you and hints that Clippy can give you. So let's go ahead and install Clippy. I'm going to bring up Terminal here in Visual Studio Code. And let's go ahead and type in here Rust up. You can see Rust up component add Clippy. Now, I've already done this. So you can see it says it's up to date. But for you, this process may actually take some time because it may have to compile Clippy locally on your computer with Rust, Rust C, which is the Rust compiler. So if this process is taking some time, don't worry about it. It's just doing its work. But um, if you see this message printed to your screen, it probably means that you were experimenting with Rust before and you already have Clippy installed on your computer. So that's, that is fine as well. So after doing this, we're going to go into Explorer here and then into the Rust crash course, into SRC folder and main RS, which is our main source code file. And in here, we're actually going to add Clippy. So let's go in here, and I'm going to say, uh, let's see. I'm going to bring up the caption at the bottom of the screen. And so what we're going to do now is going to, we're going to add Clippy to our main uh, Rust file, which is our main source code file, so that Clippy can understand that we need its help in writing the code in this file. And the way to do that is you can see with a uh, with a hashtag in here and then um, exclamation mark. And then we're going to say deny. Oops, if I can spell, I can see that today I'm actually typing really strangely. So um, because I have various keyboards in here, so we're going to say deny. And then we're going to say clippy all. All right, just like that. I'm going to close this Good stuff. So. Uh, we have that running. So we have deny Clippy all. And that is really all you have to do in order to get Clippy working uh, in, in your Rust file, in the main source file, basically. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do is to install Cargo Watch. Now, as we go on with the, with the chapters in this course, you'll see that we're going to do a lot of quick prototyping of commands. We're going to write commands really fast, erase them. We're going to change the commands and run them again. And Having a component added to our project, or globally at least, that can run uh, code for us automatically would be a huge plus. So it's kind of like hot reload in uh, Flutter, or it's kind of like how also Swift UI works, and that you write some commands and then you just press Command S, and it just automatically renders the contents for you. So 
We have something similar in Rust in that you can basically ask a cargo watch, which is a command that you'll install on your computer or like a component. And cargo watch then monitors the current folder's contents. Anytime any of those contents changes, it will recompile and rerun your executable file for you. So let's go ahead and say cargo install. Cargo install cargo watch. OK. And this process is going to take some time. It didn't take any time for me at all because I already have cargo watch, but I know it could take about a minute or two. So depending on your hardware, actually. So if it's taking some time, don't worry about it. It's just doing its job. So we basically need cargo watch is what I'm trying to say. OK, after installing cargo watch, we're going to use cargo watch to actually run our application as well. So let's go and say cargo watch and then quietly compile QC. OK, and then we're going to say run the compiled application as well and also ensure to run Clippy on our application too. OK, so if you press that and it says now project root does not exist and that's fine. We're just going to go into the Rust crash course folder and run that command again. OK, so now you can see after doing that, we're getting the, uh, the message hello world printed to the screen. So that's really good. And then let's go ahead and do some changes in the source code. So if I say hello world and remove the exclamation mark, and then I'm going to press Command S. You can see it automatically compiled the project for me, and it ran the uh, results as well. And now there's no exclamation mark in here, OK? Good stuff. Now we have Cargo Watch running our application. And actually, it's compiling our application as well using Rust C. So, uh, but just to clarify, it's not actually Cargo Watch doing the compilation, it's delegating that to Rust C and it's then going to run the results for us. So, don't think that Cargo Watch is actually the Rust compiler. Okay. So, there are two settings that I'd like to add to my project. So uh, they're, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, they're format on save and default formatter. So command shift P on Mac or control shift P on Windows and Linux. And then you type workspace JSON, you end up with this setting and then you go in here. Okay. So what we're going to do then is to going to uh, type as I'm typing in here with uh, square brackets. So we're adding some settings for the Rust language. All right, so say editor, editor format on save. And this, what is, what this is going to do is that every time you save your um, file, RS file, is going to use the Rust analyzer to automatically format it for you. Okay, so uh, you may be wondering also, okay, but so who told it to use Rust analyzer to format my code? And that's what we're going to do and uh, do it through the default formatter. So let's say editor default formatter. And in here, we're going to say Rust uh, Analyzer, as you can see in here. OK, so these are two settings that you need to add to your Rust language uh, settings in Visual Studio Code in the settings JSON file. All right, great stuff. And really, what, what it does is that if you go in here, and then because you've not formatted it incorrectly, there are too many tabs in here. And if you press Command S on Mac or Control S on Windows and Linux, to save your file, you can all of a sudden see that the Rust Analyzer reformatted your code automatically for you. So you don't have to manually go and issue the Rust Analyzer. OK, so that's about that. Also, uh, before we close up this uh, chapter, I also need to mention that I'm using GitHub Copilot for the entirety of this course. And I think I'm going to use that for all the courses from now on as well. And GitHub Copilot is definitely not required for this course. I'll just want to mention that. For those of you who don't know what GitHub Copilot is, is that it is an AI-based system uh, or software that is injected into Visual Studio Code. And it's in uh, it can be injected into Visual Studio and many other text editors and IDEs. And it will it's using AI to help you write faster code. Now, it is, I really don't recommend you using GitHub Copilot if you're starting up with Rust. So I actually think it's best that you disable it, even if you have it installed, just so that you learn the basics. Uh, so you don't actually get a lot of help with the basics, because I truly believe that you need to learn the basics yourself. So if you have GitHub Copilot, it's better that you go and disable it. But I'm going to use GitHub Copilot because it, it really helps in us moving forward with the course faster. Otherwise, I'll have to prepare uh, code 
snippets uh, for myself and then inject them manually into the course. And that is also going to take a lot of time for me to not only prepare the course, but also to record the course. So um, if you see sometimes suggestions printed in here, for instance, if I say print LN, and then all of a sudden something in here giving me a suggestion of hello world that is not me is actually github copilot thinking that i want to do this particular task so i can just press tab and it will insert that text for me so if you see these suggestions just know that it's github copilot but i always check that these suggestions are actually fitting for the purpose of the course and the material i'm trying to teach in this course so if you have it disable it uh, but if you're uh, but if you really, really want it, you just keep it. But also, it is not a required component for learning Rust. So it's actually better if you don't have it. And I, I could pretty much say that. So great stuff. So that's out the way. And let's just jump into the course then.